Determine the power required for a 1,150 kilogram car to climb a 100 meter long uphill road with a slope of 30 degrees from horizontal in 12 seconds under three different situations. In the first situation, we are considering a constant velocity across the entire process. In the second situation, we are considering the car going from rest at the bottom of the hill to 30 meters per second at the top of the hill. And in our third situation, we are considering a situation where the car starts at 35 meters per second and ends at the top of the hill at 5 meters per second. In our analysis, we are told explicitly to disregard friction, air drag, and rolling resistance. So we have a hill. The hypotenuse of that hill is 100 meters, and its slope is 30 degrees from horizontal. The car is starting the process at the bottom of the hill and ending the process at the top of the hill. I'm going to define my system as the car itself, and I'm going to assume that the mass of the car doesn't change throughout the process. Therefore, I have a closed system. Furthermore, I recognize that I'm going to treat this as a transient process because time matters, and I'm going to establish the process as starting at state one, which is a state point in time and space, and ending at a state point that I'm calling state two, because I'm particularly clever when it comes to naming my state points. In my list of assumptions so far, I have closed system. Remember from our discussion of open versus closed systems and transient versus steady processes, that the default state of the universe is an open system undergoing a transient process. So when you're treating something as an open system, that's not really an assumption that you're making. You just aren't making any assumptions about simplifications regarding the system. Similarly, when you are treating something as being transient, it's not really an assumption that you're making. The assumption that you make is simplifying reality to being a steady state process or simplifying reality to behaving as a closed system and not having mass cross the boundary. Does that distinction make sense? So I'm writing down closed system as an assumption because we are modifying the default state, but I'm not listing transient as an assumption because I'm not modifying the default state. In situation A, I'm saying v2 is equal to v1. In situation B, I'm saying v1 is 0 and v2 is 30 meters per second. And in situation C, I'm saying v1 is 35 meters per second and v2 is 5 meters per second. So I will first set up an analysis in the abstract case, and then we will simplify it for A, B, and C individually. And that analysis, as you can probably imagine, is going to start with an energy balance on the car. Like with all energy balances, we start with delta E is equal to E in minus E out. For our purposes here, we aren't distinguishing between different subcategories of energy entering nor exiting. We are just treating it as energy entering the system and increasing its kinetic and potential energy. So the E in doesn't have to be broken apart. It's just the category that we are solving for. And at that, we aren't even solving for the magnitude of energy entering. We are trying to determine the power required. So instead of energy, we are going to want to write this in terms of in terms of rate of energy entering e dot in therefore we are treating e dot in which is e in over the duration if we look at the entire process all at once and writing e in as e dot in multiplied by duration and then we are neglecting energy exiting because we don't have enough information to determine it anyway And like in the previous example, we are saying that the energy change of the system, which could be delta U, 
delta ke and or delta pe is not going to include internal energy. So we are neglecting any internal energy changes of the car during this process. So I will list that as an assumption as well. We can't neglect kinetic energy. We can't neglect potential energy. And by the way, it's important to note that we are distinguishing that assumption as the change in internal energy is zero. It's not that we're saying there is no internal energy. We're just saying whatever it is, it isn't changing. Similarly, in the previous example, when we assumed that the change in potential energy was zero, we're not saying there is no potential energy. We're just saying the change is zero. That's going to be important for part A, where the change in kinetic energy is zero. It's not that it isn't moving, that there is no kinetic energy. It's just that whatever the kinetic energy is at the beginning, it's the same at the end. Anyway, so we have the change in kinetic energy of the car plus the change in potential energy of the car is equal to the rate of energy entering the car times the duration during which that rate of energy enters. And that is what we are using as our tool for all three analyses. If we solve this for e dot n, what we're saying is the average entering energy rate must be delta ke plus delta pe divided by duration. So the power required to accomplish this process, which is the rate of energy entering the system, is the change in kinetic and potential energy divided by the duration of the process. I know the duration is 12 seconds in all three cases. All I have to do now is determine the kinetic energy change for all three parts and the potential energy change for all three parts. Let's begin with part A, where we are climbing the hill at a constant velocity. So the cruise control is locked, velocity isn't changing, whatever it is at one, it still is at two. So e dot n, which is delta ke plus delta pe divided by 12 seconds, is going to simplify down to just the change in potential energy divided by the duration. Again, it's not that there is no kinetic energy, it's just that it doesn't change. So the total change in potential energy would be the mass at state 2 times the gravitational acceleration at state 2 times the height at state 2 minus the mass at state 1 times gravity at state 1 times the height at state 1 all divided by the duration. And because I've assumed it's a closed system that the mass doesn't change, the mass can be factored out. And I think it would be reasonable to assume we have standard gravitational acceleration. So I will call that 9.81 meters per second squared. Then I can factor out both mass and gravity and write this as mass times gravity times delta h, or delta z if you prefer, divided by duration. That's something we can compute. We know the mass is 1150 kilograms. We know gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. The change in elevation here is not 100 meters. It is 100 meters multiplied by a sine of 30 degrees. And then we are dividing by 12 seconds. And it doesn't specify what unit it wants for power. So because everything else is in metric, we will express an answer in the metric unit system. The relevant unit for power would be watts or more likely for cars, kilowatts. 
So I'm going to shoot for a kilowatt as my destination. And as a general rule, it's best to start at your destination and work backwards. For these unit conversions, I'm going to start with a kilowatt, recognize that it is 1000 watts. And then I will break apart my secondary dimensions into primary dimensions. So I will write a watt as a joule per second, because that is how a watt is defined. If you don't remember that off the top of your head, it is listed on your conversion factor sheet right here. And, and then I recognize that a joule is defined as a Newton times a meter. which is also on my definition sheet. And a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, which, surprise, surprise, is on your conversion sheet. So we've started with 1,000 watts, that's a kilowatt, and we've broken it all the way apart into its primary components. Watt cancels watt, joule cancels joules, Newtons cancel Newtons, Kilograms are going to cancel kilograms, meters and meters cancel meters and meters, seconds squared cancels seconds, and I guess, let me try that again. Second squared cancels second squared, and the singular second cancels the singular second. That leaves me with kilowatts as my answer. So I'm going to pop up the calculator, zoom out just a skosh, and let's calculate a number. Here we go. 1150 times 9.81 times 100 times sine of 30. And I'm already in degrees, but I will add the degree symbol just for good measure. And then I'm dividing by 12 times 1000. That will give me an answer in kilowatts. And I determine it takes 47 kilowatts on average to accomplish this process. So I'm going to call that E dot N, the rate of energy entering on average that would accomplish this process. That power is going to increase for part B, wherein in addition to accomplishing this change in potential energy, I'm also accomplishing an increase in kinetic energy. The process begins at rest and ends at 30 meters per second. So I will start part B with the same equation I used for part A before I simplified it. And I will write this as Ke2 minus Ke1 plus Pe2 minus Pe1 all divided by 12 seconds. And total kinetic energy can be written as one half times mass times velocity squared. So Ke2 would be one half times m2 times v2 squared. Ke1 would be one half times m1 times v1 squared. And then Pe2 would be mass 2 times gravity 2 times h2 minus Pe1 would be mass 1 times gravity 1 times h1 all divided by 12 seconds for duration. So again, closed system, I can factor out the mass. Gravity, I can factor out gravity. I could actually go even further and pull mass all the way out, but I don't want to do that for a reason that'll make more sense in a second here. So 1 half times mass times V2 squared minus V1 squared plus mass times gravity times h2 minus h1 divided by delta t. So for convenience here, I can split my denominator and write this as 1 half times mass times v2 squared minus v1 squared divided by delta t plus mass times gravity times h2 minus h1 divided by delta t. And the cool thing about this is that this term is what we just calculated. It's 47 kilowatts. So all we have to do to answer this question is figure out 
how much it would take to increase the kinetic energy in this process and add it to the change in potential energy that we already know. Furthermore, for part B, V1 is zero because the process begins at rest. So this really becomes mass times V2 squared divided by two times duration plus 47 kilowatts. My mass was 1150 kilograms. And I'm dividing by two, multiplying by the velocity at state two, which was 30 meters per second, which I will write as 30 squared meters squared per second squared divided by 12 seconds. And again, my goal is to get to kilowatts. So I'm going to break out kilowatt into a thousand watts again, and a watt into a joule per second, then a joule into a Newton meter again, and a Newton into a kilogram meter per second squared again. Newton cancels Newton, joule cancels joule, watts cancels watts, second squared cancels second squared, kilogram cancels kilograms, meter squared cancels meters and meters, and I wrote the seconds in the wrong spot. A little bit too quick there. A watt is a joule per second, not a joule times a second. Okay, then seconds cancel seconds, and I'm left with kilowatts. And then to that, I'm adding 47 kilowatts. So if I pop up my calculator again, and I calculate 1150, that is 1150 times 30 squared, divided by two times 12 times 1000, I get 345 eighths, thank you calculator, 43.125 kilowatts, which when I add that to 47.0063, I get 90.1313. So to accomplish this process, the engine has to require on average 90.13 kilowatts. 43 of those kilowatts are going into increasing the kinetic energy of the car. About 47 are going into increasing the potential energy of the car. Then for part C, I'm going to open a new page here. And I'm going to copy over my equation. And my approach is going to be largely the same the biggest difference here are my actual velocities themselves so in part c the car begins at a velocity of 35 meters per second and ends at a velocity of 5 meters per second so we begin in the same way. We have the change in kinetic and potential energy divided by duration. And I'm grouping those together and factoring out mass and gravity. And we pick up here where we got rid of V1 last time. The difference here now is that I am talking about a change in velocity terms squared. So I'm going to write this as one half times 1150 kilograms. Then I'm going to divide by 12 seconds here for good measure. And then I'm taking V2, which remember was five squared minus V1, which was 35 squared meters squared per second squared. And then the same unit conversion soup. We begin with kilowatts. And a kilowatt is a thousand watts. And a watt is a joule per second. A joule is a newton times a meter. And a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And then once I calculate that quantity, I add 47 kilowatts to it. 
So watt cancels watt, joule cancels joule, newton cancels newton, meters and meters cancels meters squared, second squared cancels second squared, and seconds cancels seconds, and kilograms cancels kilograms, leaving me with kilowatts. So, heck better. Now is a bad time to go to sleep. It's time to wake up. We got math to do. I'm taking 1150 multiplied by the quantity 5 squared minus 35 squared. And then I'm dividing by 2 times 12 times 1,000. And I am missing a parenthesis. And for that first part, I am getting negative 115 seconds, which is negative 57.5. And then I add to that 47, and I get a result of negative 10. So while I'm writing that down, take a minute to ponder what that means. So a common mistake for Thermal 1 students would be to ignore the minus. They have a tendency to ignore a negative sign if they don't expect it. And that's a really bad habit to get into. The negative signs are very important, especially when we are talking about energy changes like this. The fact that the change in kinetic energy was negative implies that we are getting energy out of that decrease in kinetic energy. That change in kinetic energy is going to supply the energy for the increase in potential energy. What that means is if we start at 35 meters per second and we don't touch the accelerator at all, we will reach the top of the hill at a velocity higher than 5 meters per second because that negative delta was a larger magnitude than the amount of potential energy change required. That means we have to supply braking power. The engine would have to work to decrease the kinetic energy in order to only reach 5 meters per second at the top of the hill instead of something higher than that. You could also think of this as we are getting 10.5 kilowatts out of this situation. If we had an electric vehicle and we were able to recover that braking energy, we could get potentially 10.5 kilowatts over the course of this process.